as we reflect on the theology of grace, may we deepen our understanding of your grace in our lives. May it lead us to true wisdom and peace of soul. And we ask this in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Seed of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Well, greetings. Welcome to class number two. And uh, as it was uh, advertised on the schedule, we're celebrating an anniversary of a 500-year anniversary of Martin Luther uh, initiating the Protestant Reformation in 1517 in Germany. And, uh, as we jump into this topic of, uh, of uh, looking at Catholicism in the 16th century and Lutheranism and Protestantism in general, sometimes people will comment that, well, Charles, you're picking on Protestants. You're picking on other Christians. And I'm really not. What I'm trying to do is present uh, facts that are generally not in dispute about what occurred in the 16th century and the implications for today. And as, as honestly and without any uh, jadedness at all. Obviously, I'm speaking from the perspective of a Roman Catholic, as you would expect. However, I think where the differences lie is in the interpretation of the facts of what happened in the 16th century. Not so much the facts themselves, but what's the meaning and significance of them. So we'll point that out as we go. So uh, with that, uh, why don't we jump in? And uh, we, we have some busy slides, and I promise to make them as, as clear as possible. But what we're really talking about when we look at the 16th century is what I call this transition uh, phase is occurring from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment. And uh, what had occurred beforehand is you had in the 11th century, the 12th century, the 13th century, what I would call the influence of reforming popes. Popes that came from religious orders, actually, such as the Cistercians or the Dominicans, who had an eye toward purifying the church in its embrace of the faith. And what you had occur later, particularly after, uh, you remember the papal schisms of the 14th century, where you had two people claiming to be the pope. And then we had a third one, and that was all resolved by around 1415, you had more of opportunists and careerists becoming the popes and leading the church uh, in the 15th century and 16th century. And so there's a subtle, unfortunately, uh, corruption occurring at the highest levels in the church. And, and there's a saying in business that companies in business often get the labor unions they deserve. And it's true in the church, too. But the church often gets the heretics it deserves because of its corruption and its imperfect embrace of the gospel. Uh, other voices come out of the woodwork, uh, and though they might be criticizing the right things, their solution is worse, as we'll see. There are other factors at work here uh, by the 16th century, what's often called in history books the rise of nation states, so the emergence of Spain, uh, France, Italy, as countries as we know them today. Germany is still largely a basket case uh, where it's very fragmented into different what are called prince electors who elect the Holy Roman Emperor. Another factor is the rise of Islam in <coughs> Eastern Europe. Uh, so the Turks, a name from history you might recall, Suleiman the Great, uh, by the 1520s, he had taken Belgrade in today Serbia. He had taken Buda and Pest in Hungary by the 1520s. So Islam was knocking on the door uh, of Western Europe because it was in Eastern Europe. We had a pope at this time, uh, Pope Leo X, who was a Medici Pope, and maybe you've seen the television series on Medicis and Medici Popes. Uh, and his, he has the distinction of being the last Pope in our history up to this time who was elected Pope when he wasn't even a priest. And so in the space of a week, he was ordained a priest, then made a bishop, then made a cardinal, and then made Pope. And that gives you a sense of the papacy and the different bishops who got their diocese throughout the world or in Europe, were these were almost like entitlements, like getting into Harvard, uh, like 
Uh, not that that doesn't require hard work, but who you knew got you to be a bishop or a pope. And uh, as a result, you got an inferior type of man in those jobs. He is quoted as saying, since God has given us the papacy, let us enjoy it. Uh, not a reformer. And he was one of the uh, popes, not the only one, who promoted indulgences throughout Europe to pay for St. Peter's, which was under construction. Much of the clergy at this time was lax, uneducated, as I put it, unable to say mass accurately, correctly. There are written missals by local clergy saying, in the name of the fatherland, the daughter, and the Holy Spirit, because they, they said Latin, in nomine patria, which is fatherland or country, filia, which is actually daughter, not filius, and then they got the Holy Spirit right. So you had uh, more times than not priests who couldn't say Mass accurately, uh, weren't available, had concubines, uh, and so on. And this, I won't say this was the majority situation, but it was significant. And so uh, there's a tendency to think that uh, we are living in difficult times now in the church, but as you read history, you realize some of these issues are, are in some ways worse in prior times. There's a figure here that I want to introduce to you, Albert of Brandenburg, another just peach <coughs> of a guy. Uh, he became archbishop in 1513 in Magdeburg and in Mainz in 1514. So he got several bishoprics or revenues associated with those dioceses uh, at a young age. And uh, he eventually made an agreement with the Pope to promote indulgences in Germany if he, if he got a cut of the proceeds. Uh, and then the rest of the proceeds go back to Rome to pay for St. Peter's. So you thought I was going to bash Protestants all night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was said about uh, Albert of Brandenburg, the only time he visited his Diocese of Mainz was on the day of his funeral. Uh, and so just... <laughs> Typical, unfortunately, of the time in Germany. Interestingly, the last point here is that uh, indulgences were not presented accurately uh, to the people. And as a result, a cynicism developed. And indulgence marketing, and this is a literal quote from a priest who was promoting indulgences in Germany at this time. When the coin in the cup rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And this is something, obviously, that was uh, disgusting to Luther, and it would be to anyone. Interestingly, in the 95 theses that Luther pinned to the door uh, in October of 1517, he actually defends the legitimate practice of papal indulgences. That's a little-known fact, but if you read through the 95 theses, uh, which I did, um, several of them refer to the legitimate use of indulgences. Luther will abandon that position by uh, around 1518 uh, as, as his position hardens against the church and the church starts taking him on directly. If we continue, as I mentioned, Germany was a fragmented European country much more so than if you think of France or Spain at the time. And this really won't get resolved, frankly, until Bismarck in the 19th century. Uh, and it really continued. Uh, and the German people finally wised up after Napoleon marched through them like nothing because <laughs> they were so divided uh, in the uh, early part of the 19th century, latter parts of the 18th <coughs> century. And so they thought to themselves, oh, we can't ever let that happen again. But at this point, Germany is still very fragmented. There are six or seven prince electors who run the country, basically, dukes and, and princes who are, have the responsibility to elect the Holy Roman Emperor. Frederick was the, the elector in Saxony where Luther was located. So there's, there's decades of, of strife between the landed owners and the people who worked on the farms, much more so than uh, in other European countries of the time. 
and this will bubble up, as we'll see later. Uh, but the German electors, Frederick being one of them, uh, didn't like all of the money leaving Germany going back to Rome at all. Now, I'm not reducing their protection of Luther to just an economic interest, uh, but as we'll see, uh, that was certainly primary. They saw in Luther an opportunity uh, to begin to keep uh, some of the revenues that were flowing out to Rome. I mention here as an aside, again, our friend Albert of Brandenburg. Actually, after uh, the resolution that was, uh, was established by Charles V on the different faiths in the different uh, areas of Germany, he made a deal with the Protestants in his area that if they paid him 500,000 florins, he would allow them the free exercise of their faith. So you see a lot of transaction and economic things are in play here uh, as we go with the people who called the shots, the political leaders in Germany. Because the question often comes up, why wasn't Luther just dealt with the way other heretics were prior to him? Why did he receive this protection? Because of these economic interests, I believe. Uh, Another factor, Charles V, the new Holy Roman Emperor at the time, saw the, the Turks coming uh, in Eastern Europe, and he needed a united front uh, to protect Western Europe. So he wasn't about to stir the pot with these German princes who were the next buffer zone uh, and create a divided Christianity and not be able to fend off the Turks. So he had to make some concrete priority decisions. And this bumbling monk from Wittenberg, uh, he can wait. Uh, we'll deal with him later, but we've got real problems. And if you think about the history of the Turkish invasions, as I mentioned, by the 1520s, they were in Belgrade, they were in Budapest. Uh, and 1571 was the Battle of Lepanto, uh, which was a major victory for, the, for Christian forces. But nevertheless, they didn't know that at the time of the 1520s. This was a very ominous sign against them. I should also mention the printing press, uh, which was, in a way, like our modern-day Internet for the time. Uh, it was able to disseminate Luther's ideas very quickly. Uh, and so bad ideas and good ideas got out there. Also, there were no copyright laws at the time, which actually annoyed Luther, where he would produce a work, give it to his local printer, and a copy would go to another city that had a printing press, and a thousand other copies would be made without his knowledge. And so historians look at this and take this into account that did Luther even want to start a Reformation? Or was this more of a Reformation of the printing press? Because there's a letter he wrote to one of his printers that he said, what, what's happening? <laughs> uh, a lot of his works were very popular and sold out, and he wasn't necessarily even in control of its distribution after a certain point. The same was true of the German Bible he produced, which really invented the modern German language when he translated the Bible into the uh, common language of Germany of the time. Wide dissemination, and it sold out almost immediately because there was no centralized copyright laws and things could be disseminated rapidly. The Peasants' Rebellion of 1525, this is actually a significant event. Up to this point, say between 1517 and 1525, Luther was advocating for individuals, for the people to rise up and reclaim a true Christian faith. Well, they did rise up. And the princes encouraged it for a while because it served their interest to smash the Catholic Church However, they couldn't control it, so churches were looted, uh, uh, homes of the wealthy were being ransacked, and they said, wait a minute, we have to call an end to this. Luther had encouraged this up to a point, and then he realized that this was getting out of control, the mob was taking over, so he actually wrote a letter, a letter that had launched the Peasants' Rebellion, and then he wrote another one saying to the princes, do whatever you need to do to stop this because it's out of control. He then went on his honeymoon with a nun who had left her convent while 100,000 peasants were killed by the German uh, dukes and princes. And that's called the Peasants' Rebellion of 1525. 
and 100,000 people were killed. The last thing I would mention is the 16th century isn't just about Lutheranism. We see all the other uh, uh, mainline Protestant faiths uh, beginning. And I call this kind of the Tower of Babel now starts. There are 41,000 Christian denominations throughout the world. 41,000. These are just the mainstreams, and don't worry, I'm not going to walk through all these. Uh, but I, I, I give this to you just as a visual, and if you think about it, the time scale is off. This is 1,500 years. If this was really drawn to scale, 1,500 would be three-fourths of the page down. Then you have the splintering. But the splintering is so significant historically, uh, politically, uh, that in order to capture it all, <laughs> I had to, had to move it back this way. But you can see the fragmentation that occurred. And more is at work here than just simply Luther. It was in the air. And uh, not to dwell on this too long, but um, a study was done by uh, a group of sociologists on what determined whether a country went Protestant or not. You ever ask yourself that question? Why did France and Spain and Italy stay Catholic and Denmark and Sweden and Germany and other places not? So they looked at a lot of factors. Was it the fact that university towns went Protestant or Catholic one way or the other? They found, no, that's not the case. Was it that if a town had a printing press, did they go Catholic or Protestant? Was that a driver? And they found, no, the data was scrambled. They surveyed 461 towns in Germany. And then they looked more broadly uh, across Europe. And what they came to conclude was if the church was weak, meaning owned very little property, or was controlled already by the state, it stayed Catholic. So, for example, it's counterintuitive, but you'll see in a moment what I mean. In France, the king and the princes selected all the bishops. They owned all the church lands already. In Spain, same thing. In some of these Catholic countries, it's still the case that the leader of that country, if it's Catholic, picks the slate of bishops that the pope chooses from. But in that time, France and Spain already controlled everything related to the church. We look at Denmark, for example. The church owned, independently of the state, about a third of the lands in Denmark. If you're a prince and rebellion is in the air, uh, that's kind of a tasty thing to think about. Same thing in Sweden. In the UK, in England, what, what happened? What did Henry do with the monasteries? He seized them. And in fact, if, when you tour these sites today, you'll see beautiful mansions that in part have the stones of the monastery that's in ruins down, in the, down the hill. So where the church was weak and frankly under the thumb of the state already, it stayed Catholic. Where it was independent, and there were parts of Germany, obviously, that were independent. Uh, there were things that were available to grab, and they were grabbed. That determined whether something went Protestant or Catholic. Now, again, that can be, that's distasteful, obviously, for uh, Protestant faiths. But I don't, no one really believes that the German electors were, were convinced by Luther's interpretation of Paul's letters, that that's where they were going to, they, they probably were never inside of a church, <laughs> just like the archbishops weren't. So to say that they had a particular theological commitment to Luther is stretching it, because what they really had a commitment to was their economic gain. Other things going on as we look at uh, Luther himself, born in 1483 and died in 1546. He was born to... Uh, a family where his father, Hans, worked in copper mines and later established himself as a successful businessman. Uh, he did have a strict upbringing, which Luther notes in uh, a lot of the works that have been gathered and collected. Well over 55 volumes of Luther's writings are, have been collected and, and gathered. So we actually know a lot about Luther. And the record keeping of the German universities, as we would expect of Germans, is very meticulous. And to this day, you can see who took what classes in those universities. 
So uh, he had a, a fairly strict upbringing, and I won't go through all of this. You can read those bullets on, on uh, the punishments he would often receive. Uh, and there is some debate about, was it Luther who had the experience in the thunderstorm or a friend of his who died in that thunderstorm? Some evidence points to, yes, it was Luther who was almost struck by lightning, and he made a vow to become a priest, a monk. Or there's some evidence that a close friend of his uh, was struck by lightning, and it's, it, it doesn't matter. The experience really motivated him where he made a promise to God that he would become a monk and a priest. He was a, a good student, as you can see, uh, 13 out of 57 students in undergrad and in his master's program, second out of 17, so uh, a good student. I will say at the time, like a lot of things, Thomistic philosophy and theology, the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas, was in radical decline, and a philosophical school called nominalism was in its ascendance. What is nominalism? Very briefly, it, it denies that there's such a thing as nature. And you might say, oh, well, we talked about nature and grace last time, and it will, it's, it's basically a school that when we talk about natures in creation, whether it's human nature or the nature of any animal, it's just a naming convention. So if we say, oh, he's nominally Catholic, we mean he's Catholic in name only. If we talk about human nature, it's just a way of speaking. It's not anything inherent in things. It's just a philosophical categorization. There's no reality to nature as such. So Luther was influenced by this, and you can see what's beginning to happen in his intellectual formation is that nature is depreciated, is degraded, is a non-existent thing. There is no nature. Continuing, at a certain point, Luther abandons his law career and enters the Augustinian <coughs> cloister. Now, this is characteristic of the time, but the monastic practices of that time uh, involve, obviously, daily spiritual direction, daily confession, and Luther entered already as someone who was scrupulous, as someone who was very concerned about their status before God. And it didn't take long before this uh, monastery in Erfurt almost uh, stimulated a further uh, descent into this scrupulosity. Uh, and I, I mention out that the, the type of spiritual direction that was uh, popular at the time, and to some extent still is, is this, this soul-searching of not only what did you do, but what are your motivations for what you did, right or wrong? And this, in a perhaps unstable person, will lead to a kind of compulsion uh, that will prove to be unhealthy, especially in Luther's case. In fact, his confessor once said to him, go off, will you please, and commit a real sin <laughs> so you have something to confess and, and not this self-critique that was going on excessively. Luther noted in his own works that when his first mass came around, uh, he was traumatized by that and said to his confreres that he almost ran out of the church when it came time for the consecration. He also recalled, and this is 20, 30 years later, he went up to his parents and his father and he said, see, I'm now a priest, didn't this turn out all right? And Hans said to him, you've forgotten the fourth commandment of honor your father and mother. I wanted <coughs> you to be a lawyer. And that was the end. Of, and so there is this, this distance that, that would dog Luther his whole life. In the bibliography is the Catholic Encyclopedia Online. And it, if you were to buy the volumes, it's probably a $500 purchase. You can see it online for nothing on the Internet. And they have a a long and informative article on Luther that I, I just took a snippet and I'll read it to you uh, briefly. And this is, they're quoting various Protestant biographers of Luther. So the point I would underscore is this is not something the interpretation Lutherans might dispute, but the facts of this are really not in dispute, and some of these interpretations are from Protestant historians. So I, I want to emphasize this is not... Uh, 
a Catholic bashing Luther. So, quote, this condition of morbidity finally developed into formal scrupulosity. Infractions of the rules, breaches of discipline, distorted aesthetic practices followed in quick succession and with increasing gravity. These followed by spasmodic convulsive reactions made life an agony. The solemn obligation of reciting the daily office, an obligation binding under penalty of mortal sin, was neglected to allow more time for study, with the result that the bravery was abandoned for weeks. Then in paroxysmal remorse, Luther would lock himself into a cell and by one retroact, retroactive act, make amends for all he neglected. He would abstain from all food and drink, torture himself by harrowing mortifications to an extent that not only made him the victim of insomnia for five weeks at one time, but threatened to drive him into insanity. The prescribed and regulated ascetical exercises were arbitrarily set aside. Disregarding the monastic regulations and counsels of his confessor, he devised his own, which naturally gave him the character of singularity in his community. Like every victim of scrupulosity, he saw nothing in himself but wickedness and corruption. God was minister of wrath and vengeance. His sorrow for sin was devoid of humble charity and childlike confidence in the pardoning mercy of God and Jesus Christ. This anger of God, which pursued him like his shadow, could only be averted by his own righteousness, by the efficacy of servile works, because he was still a Roman Catholic at this time. <clears throat> Such an attitude of mind was necessarily followed by hopeless discouragement and sullen despondency, creating a condition of soul in which he actually, quote, hated God and was angry at him, blasphemed God, and deplored that he was ever born. This abnormal condition produced a brooding melancholy, physical, mental, and spiritual depression, which later, by a strange process of reasoning, he ascribed to the teaching of the church concerning good works, while all the time he was living in direct and absolute opposition to its doctrinal teaching and disciplinary code. Of course, this self-willed self -willed positiveness and hypochondriac asceticism, as usually happens in cases of morbidly scrupulous natures, found no relief in the sacraments. His general confessions at Effert and Rome, Luther made a visit to Rome, which completely disgusted him as well, did not touch the root of the evil. His whole being was wrought up to such an acute tension that he actually regretted his parents were not dead, that he might avail himself of the facilities of Rome afforded to save them from purgatory. For religion's sake, he was ready to become the most brutal murderer to kill all who even by syllable refuse submission to the Pope. Such a tense and neurotic physical condition demanded a reaction. And as frequently occurs in analogous cases, it went to the diametric extreme. So finishing up this citation, which I encourage you to read the article in its entirety, Quote, the undue importance he had placed on his own strength in the spiritual process of justification, he now peremptively and completely rejected. He convinced himself that man, as a consequence of original sin, was totally depraved, destitute of free will, that all works, even those directed towards the good, were nothing more than an outgrowth of his corrupted will, and in the judgments of God, in reality, mortal sins. Man can only be saved by faith alone. Our faith in Christ makes his merits our possession, envelops us in the garb of righteousness, which hides our guilt and sinfulness and supplies in abundance every defect of human righteousness. Quote, Be a sinner and, save on, and sin on bravely, but have stronger faith and rejoice in Christ, who is the victor of sin, death, and the world. Do not for a moment imagine that this life is the abiding place of justice. Sin must be committed. To you it ought to be sufficient that you acknowledge the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. The sin cannot tear you away from him, even though you commit adultery a hundred times a day and commit as many murders, end quote. That's taken directly from Luther's works. That doesn't sound like St. Paul, does it? <laughs> I'm not going to go through this entire chart, but I, I wanted to give you just background, a framework for what were the main themes of Luther's controversy, and then we'll get to the substance of 
the justification by faith. I'll, I'll just deal with the first three. And, and these we actually touched on in the course on the fathers of the church, if you might recall. The first one is sola scriptura, Bible only, is the source of our faith. And everything else that the Catholic Church has come up with is just man-made barnacles, rust on the pure metal of the simple preaching of the gospel. And this Catholic Church, which as we know is a creation of Constantine in the 4th century, uh, has just laid on top things like purgatory and the dogmas about Mary and all these other sacraments that aren't in the gospel uh, that that is a barrier now to the pure faith that's Bible-based only. And the irony is, is that that's a very unbiblical view. And I remember when I said this last time, you all looked at me strangely or more strangely than you normally do. Uh, but if you think about it, uh, ask a fundamentalist next time you bump into them, who, where is that in the Bible, you Catholic? Uh, ask them, who wrote their table of contents page of their Bible? a funny question, but ask them, why do you think there are 27 books in the New Testament and not three or 12? Why those four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Why those versions of those four Gospels, given that we've got 4,000 fragments of the New Testament? We have no original from the hand of the author. So who decided what went into the Old and New Testament? And you'll get a, a look that uh, as I say, resembles a calculator dividing by zero. Uh, because whatever they say in response to that question is an extra-biblical interpretation, meaning it's something not in the Bible, obviously, to justify how the Bible came together. So the question of authority is inescapable from the beginning. Why? Because the apostolic tradition preceded the formation of the New Testament. So think about that for a moment. The apostolic preaching preceded the writing of the New Testament. So what was the standard by which the texts, when they were eventually written, were chosen? Could they appeal to something written? No. No. What did they appeal to? The authority of the apostles and their successors. Now, the Protestant response to that is, that's too simple. The, the works selected themselves over time through their use. So Matthew made it into the New Testament because the Gospel of Matthew was used broadly across many churches. And each of the books of the New Testament had that same kind of prominence. And it's an interesting argument to make about, well, these texts just by consensus, by use, determine what went in to the, the New Testament, for example. The problem with that, that argument is that most people couldn't read. The consensus was the bishops and the apostolic tradition. And... Did, did the Holy Spirit guarantee that selection process? Where's that in the Bible? You, you see how it's a circular. As soon as you step outside the text, you're in the whirlwind of authority. Whose authority? Interpretation? Whose interpretation? Consensus? What constitutes consensus exactly? The majority of the bishops in the world in the 4th century were Arian heretics. Would that consensus be what drives what's true? You see how flimsy uh, this issue is for all <coughs> Protestant faiths who are Bible only. It's their Achilles heel because you cannot believe the Bible is inspired if you do not in some way assign grace infallibly to the communities and institutions that put the Bible together. Because if they can err in that selection process, then what, what guarantee do we have that those four Gospels are even accurate to what the apostles preached? None at all. This is the Achilles heel of all Protestant faiths. They cannot account for the formation and origin of the New Testament. 
So when I say Bible-only faiths are unbiblical, you now know what I mean. Because they have to appeal to something else, not in the Bible, to justify themselves. Human nature and free will. Human nature is wholly corrupted by original sin, and we're truly deprived of free choices in grace, left to ourselves. We're not even free. We're free to be corrupt for Luther. Obviously, for the Catholic tradition, we cooperate with God's grace, and this is a mystery of faith, that as a free person, I can, under the impulse of grace, cooperate with God's grace. God's grace is completely gratuitous. I can't pull myself up by my earlobes to earn it, but I can cooperate with it under God's impulse and grace. And the third one I would mention is this justification by faith. For Luther, justification is by faith alone. And good works are actually the devil's deception and that your sense of doing something or other to merit an increase in grace or in any way cooperate with God's grace is an illusion and a toxic illusion. The other ones you can read about, I won't spend uh, any time on them tonight. So let's go to the substance of the justification by faith alone controversy. And I'll grab my pen. So as I mentioned, we are justified by faith alone. The way Luther described this is that the pure and true righteousness of Jesus Christ is what I call here externally imputed to us, extended to us. It it covers us, and we are rendered justified before God. Any of our actions before, during, and after justification are irrelevant to that. Our our works are really, if anything, just the fruit of that primal justification by God. But in no way do they advance it, do they further it, uh, or develop it in us in any real way. As an aside, other Protestant faiths are going to back off from this, and I think of Methodists, and Presbyterians, but we won't get into that tonight because we could spend all night on what, what the differences are. But for Luther, as I mentioned last class, justification is a bit like God snowing on the dung heap of human nature and covering it up. And so when we look at it, we see a beautiful snow-capped mountain. When God looks at us, he sees a beautiful snowy hill. There is no internal rejuvenation of the human person or human nature because there is no human nature. And if there is one, it's completely corrupted by original sin. So God snows on us and covers us up. So what is justification by faith? Concretely, it is my subjective confidence that I have accepted that fact, that through the merits of Jesus Christ, I have been justified, which sounds attractive to us. It gets, he gets it half right. Uh, and as a result, he will refer to it, and his uh, commentators will refer to it as fiduciary faith, namely my subjective confidence that I am justified, not by my own works or choices, but God has deemed me justified through the merits of Jesus Christ. I know it as an aside that this is a departure from the Catholic position of 1,500 years. Namely, faith is actually an assent of my mind to the truths of faith. There's content to what I believe. And we see, as we will see, this is all over the New Testament. So faith is actually believing claims God has made about himself, whether it's in the Old Testament or in the new, through Jesus Christ. Luther thought that his commentary on the Galatians best expressed his thought, and he will make much to do about Paul's letter to the Galatians. You might recall the background of that letter is that that the Jewish people in Galatia were insisting that the practices of the law were required to be part of the new Christian movement. 
and that Paul had some very stern things to say about that, including uh, the, the, the dichotomy between the works of the law, which would be the laws related to the covenant, and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. But what, what Luther did, and in fact Augustine also did, perhaps inappropriately in Augustine's case, uh, was to psychological, psychologize that, make that into a faith-works dichotomy in the 16th century versus a Old Covenant, New Covenant in Jesus Christ dichotomy, which is what Paul was talking about. Paul was not particularly concerned about the theology of faith and works. He was concerned about the fact that you don't have to be Jewish anymore to follow Jesus Christ. You don't have to be circumcised. <clears throat> Luther took that and ran with it in a similar way that St. Augustine actually did. And he made that into a faith works thing, which isn't what its, its purpose was. And interestingly, this is called the New Perspective on Paul Theology, which started in the 1970s and 80s by Protestant scripture scholars. And N.T. Wright, who is in your bibliography, wrote a fantastic book on the theology of justification in the Old and New Testament. And he is an Anglican theologian. Uh, and so if you want a very good inside baseball perspective on this, on why Luther is dead wrong on how he interpreted Paul, N.T. Wright's book is a very good uh, work that you might want to look at. I'd also mention that uh, Luther altered Romans, uh, the, the key text of justification by faith. Quote, Romans chapter 3, verse 28, For we hold that a man is justified by faith, and then he added, alone, apart from the works of the law. And I'm quoting now from volume 55 of Luther's works, and please rush out and read all 55 volumes. <laughs> but, quote, you tell me what a great fuss the papists are making because the word alone is not in the text of Paul. Say right out to him, Dr. Martin Luther will have it so. I will have it so, and I order it to be so, and my will is reason enough. I know very well that the word alone is not in the Latin or Greek text. This isn't disputed uh, by Protestant scholars or historians, so I'm not uh, bashing Martin Luther. A little intermezzo, a little interlude that I thought you would enjoy because these are heavy sledding, but I, I couldn't resist when I saw this cartoon, and it's probably uh, you know a Protestant RCIA, and so this is where our movement came along and finally got the Bible right. So that's a more accurate timeline, too. <laughs> Continuing, if you remember one thing from tonight, this is the slide. So let me try to, to summarize each position because it, it covers every possibility, so to speak. Under the Lutheran point of view, and again, this is not shared by all Protestant faiths. I want to emphasize that. But you see how I drew that. God's grace is in the blue, and it covers us over. It never really makes contact with human nature because what is beautiful and grace can never intermingle with what is corrupt. So it covers us over. This is sometimes called juridical justification or forensic justification, but it is externally imputed to us. Another image Luther used was horse and rider. We're the horse. Who's your rider? It's either God or the devil, and you have very little to do about it. If God is riding you, you're justified. If the devil's riding you, you're not. Calvin will also, John Calvin, will also run with that image. But there is no real contact between grace and nature, and I emphasize this in the first class. Let me go to the other side now. The, the Pelagian view. Pelagius was a 4th century, and his followers 5th century, theologian who basically, and I'm summarizing him, that human nature, the human person, initiates 
the contact with God. Human nature by itself cannot earn grace. But we initiate and then God responds. And the example would be, I'm in a well. I can't get out of this deep well. I reach up. God's hand reaches down. I grab it. And he pulls me out of the well of my sin and corruption. Now that's kind of attractive. We kind of like that. And in fact, a lot of Catholic preaching kind of presents our faith that way. (laughs) That our response, God speaks in our response. We hear that kind of phrasing a lot. But our response is, I'm pulling myself, I'm reaching up on my own steam. That's not a Catholic point of view. But that's the Pelagian view that Augustine, St. Augustine in the 4th century and 5th century was most concerned about combating. And his formulation is, which was then later developed by Aquinas, is that there is a cooperation that occurs. Human nature is wounded and is corrupt, but it can still cooperate on some level under the impulse of God's grace. Not by itself, but God can stimulate a free act in us, a graced free act. And so that is the Catholic position. The way I drew this is that we are contained, if you will, in God's grace. And this is the mystery of faith, that God doesn't coerce us against our will, nor are we completely passive. Rather, we can enter into a kind of partnership with God under his grace. (laughs) It's kind of pleasant. (laughs) It's appropriate the music would play when we get to the Catholic position. But... um, We are able to cooperate with God, but under his grace. We can't cooperate with God without his grace. Now, the common reaction is, well, then I'm not free. Were you free when you walked here or drove here today? (laughs) So doctor's saying uh, you you might have an emergency call there, so we give him a little liberty there. But... um, You might think, yeah, I was free, but think of all the things that went into assisting you in being here tonight. Did you feel like you were coerced? Hopefully you didn't feel that way. (laughs) (laughs) And the image that we see in the Gospels is the mustard seed or the imagery of, of flowers growing that just as God can make a seed grow into a mustard, a large tree, so too he created free creatures who he can stimulate to still be free under his impulse and influence. We are free in grace. We are free in the truth. And that's the mystery. How do we hold those two things together? And a good definition of heresy is an impatience with this paradox of faith. I want to resolve it one way or the other. So Luther resolved it by saying, no human contribution, no free will. It's easier just to say it's all on God. The Pelagians, we have the reality of free choice. So I have to initiate that. Nothing else is going to get to me unless I initiate it. And that sounds good, too. But the, the genius of the Catholic position is, yes, both are true. And the mystery is our cooperation under that divine influence. Just going one step deeper, the way this is typically explained is a distinction between God's antecedent will and God's consequent will, or effective will, or efficacious will. I'm hoping this helps. If it doesn't, don't worry. But we know and believe that God desires everyone to be saved. That's his antecedent will. He desires everyone that was ever created to be saved. And he gives sufficient graces to everyone ever created to be saved. Sufficient graces give us a real capability to perform a graced act. 
but it doesn't give us an actual capability. I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment. God's consequent will is what actually happened. Who actually is saved? And this is the whole idea of, of predestination, that God's effective will, what actually happens, is this consequent will. And this distinction between sufficient graces and efficacious graces is based upon this distinction between God desiring everyone to be saved and then introduce human freedom and who is actually saved. And this mystery is that, as I said before, efficacious graces are when we do not resist the sufficient graces that God offers to us. They become efficacious under his impulse. So what's the human contribution? We can resist, and then they're just merely sufficient. Or we can cooperate under God's grace and achieve actual sanctifying grace in our souls. The example I give is the power of sight. Do you have the power of sight when you're sleeping? Yes, you do. Are you actually seeing No, you're not. But you have the ability to see. When you are awake, you can actually see. So sufficient graces are something real. So why did the Catholic Church and its theology insist on the existence of sufficient graces? Because it wants to guarantee human freedom. Because human freedom can say no to God. God offered sufficient graces and human freedom resisted. That's another angle on the mystery of faith. Think of a parent who desires their children's well-being and health. They let them out of the house, though. They let them cross the street. They let them go to school by themselves for the first time. There's a chance they might get hit by a car when they do that. So a parent's antecedent will is the health and development of their child. What actually might happen is a tragedy. So that can be a useful example as well. God desires all of us to be saved and provides sufficient graces for all to be saved. And the mystery of human freedom is those can be resisted. And that's why sufficient graces are there. Interestingly, Protestant theologians and Jansenists from the 17th century, a a heretical group, that Blaise Pascal was part of for a while, often would say, oh, Lord, free us from sufficient grace. (laughs) Because this aspect of the mystery is troublesome for anyone who's honest about it. This is not ultimately a clear, crystal clear explanation, is it? Because how do we navigate this? What is that transition from sufficient to efficacious grace? And the mystery reasserts itself. So you might remember in class one I was talking about Boethius and the hydra's head, and every time he cut the head of the snake, two more heads pop up. Here's another example of it. Yes. Don't be a Pelagian. (laughs) Keep in mind the past and future to God are not... Oh, uh, does not God predestine some to hell because past and future... He sees what's going to happen. And the way I would answer, and this is a classic question, is that past and future in God are not known as past and future in God. They're known as an eternal now, an eternal present. So there's no God waiting on pins and needles if the person is going to turn their life around. There's no surprise factor. It's known in that eternal now. Now, getting to the root of your question, Evil is a defect in the will. Whatever is bad is a lack of goodness that should be there. Uh, And so, for example, if someone uh, walks with a limp, they have a bad leg. It's not that there's a, a reality to the limping as such. It's just a shorter leg, let's say. Or a bad apple is an apple that has a worm in it. It's not an it's not a full apple. 
So evil is always a defect in the will, the human will. And God can't be the cause of that defect. Uh, so ultimately, does God in his eternal now know who's saved and who isn't? Of course he does. Did he in some way predestine that? Think of the word predestined. Pre has a temporal aspect to it that has no place in God. There is no predestination as predestination in God. There's just the eternal now. And so we live out in time dramatically. We work out our salvation in fear and trembling. There is none of that temporal predestination in God. Though looking back, it it can feel that way. But there is no looking back, looking forward in God. And ultimately, this is something, again, a mystery of faith. We, we, we can just take stabs at explaining this. But as soon as you assign a temporal category to God, pre, he predestined so-and-so, there is no pre or post in God. Let me keep rolling here. Um, just a little deeper uh, insight into Luther and the Protestant faith in general coming out of the 16th century. It's not in your bibliography because it's a very expensive uh, uh, set of volumes, but Philip Hughes wrote a, a history of the church and uh, it makes a very interesting point that fundamentally Luther and the Protestant faith in general coming out of the 16th century stood Christianity on its head because they started with the inadequacy, the corruption of the human person, not with the glory of God. And what I spent a lot of time talking about in the first class, look at what God has accomplished in Jesus Christ for us. That's what the apostles preached. What did the reformers start with? They started with the corruption of the human person, the self. Let me read a quotation from Hughes's history. Lutheranism, as being the very inversion of Christianity, and of this as providing the main source of difference between Protestants and Catholics. The kind of difference this was must be stated, for it explains why henceforth they never really understood each other, and why with Luther all previous Christian history is brought up sharp. It explains how to Catholics... Luther is most of all a revolutionary. And the new reform religion, not religion at all, in the sense that Catholicism is a religion. Briefly, what Luther did was to make man, not God, the center of those activities to the sum of which we give the term religion. Man's need of God, not God's glory. And the scriptural paradox was once again fulfilled that he who would save his life must lose it. From the beginning of his own career as a friar at least, the human subject was to Luther of more concern than God. Not as a theory, but practically. Luther's great achievement from this point of view was in in effect the translation of his own more or less native mystical egocentrism into a foundation dogma of Christian belief. That's a very provocative passage, and I believe it's true. If you think about the brief summary of of Luther's life, his preoccupation was himself before God. And he launched this entire trajectory in theology and history of the self brooding over itself. What is my status before God? Instead of what the gospel message is, which is, look what Jesus has done for us. There's an inversion. And in a way, it, it exemplifies the, the historical times we're changing. We are leaving the medieval synthesis. We've left it. We're now right on the border of the Enlightenment project, which I'll talk about briefly. Continuing... Just sweeping up the bits on, on why Luther's theology was not even original. Uh, there were earlier uh, 
heretics who had espoused the same points of view. For example, uh, John Huss out of uh, what was then Czechoslov or now Czechoslovakia or Bohemia, uh, who he died in 1415. Uh, John Wycliffe in England uh, earlier. So what Luther was promoting was not new at all. And, of course, these texts from the New Testament uh, were used against Luther, and uh, they're, they're kind of, they show how Luther tapped into a mood more than the, that his theology was something uh, amazing and new and wonderful. Uh, so, for example, in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 4, Paul refers to Abraham's faith in God's promises accorded to him as righteousness, not his observance of the law. Now, as we'll see, it was Abraham's faith in God's commitments to him, namely, your descendants will number like the sands on the seashore. That was what Abraham was believing. We'll get to that in a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. Remember this one, and this is often recited at weddings. So faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Wait a minute. We, we just heard from Luther that justification by faith alone is what saves you. What's this love stuff that Paul is talking about? And it's the greatest of the three? That, that has to be a typo. If Luther was attentive, he should have X'd that out as well. Or Hebrews chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. And without faith, is, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, took heed and constructed an ark for saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was to go. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. What promise? The land and descendants. So here, the sense of faith is believing certain claims revealed by God, not subjective confidence of some experience, but actual Noah build an ark because a flood is coming. Okay. Abram, leave the land of Ur and travel where I will tell you to inherit land and your descendants will number, etc. So faith has content. It's not subjective fiduciary faith. Continuing, Galatians, Luther's favorite commentary. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is of any avail, but faith working through love. Wait, working through love? Doesn't make any sense. Or the letter of James, with which Luther described as straw. Faith without works is dead. So you see how this is kind of... Uh, Luther's arguments are, are fifth grade, and, and no serious person thinks that sacred scripture justifies the theological position that he took, unless you have a commitment to it that has nothing to do with sacred scripture. We, we, we wouldn't complete this section without talking about the Council of Trent, which was convened in 1545 to 1563, largely in response to the Protestant revolt of Luther, of John Calvin, and others on this particular question, and others. The, the council is really most known for its responses to these questions of grace and the sacraments and the mass, uh, and also identifying the works of the Bible definitively, the first time we have a definitive list of the Bible. You can see in reaction to, in response to, what had gone before. So the council affirmed the utter gratuity of God's grace and our justification and initial sanctification. We can do nothing to quote-unquote earn this, nothing at all. 
left to ourselves. We can cooperate under God's grace. That's that mystery I keep going back to. But resist the urge to try to solve that. Because you will lurch to one side or the other and get running back and forth. Because we hit two doorstops. There's no getting around it. The reality of our free will and the reality of God's grace that is well beyond us and our own merits. The second, the true freedom of the will under God's grace. Third, that we are truly made new and truly sanctified. Grace makes real contact with us in our humanity. Fourth, and this was most offensive to the Protestants and probably sealed the deal of separation. Never it was going to come back together again. That once we are justified in grace and that we have sanctifying grace in our souls, we can continue to cooperate with God and merit an increase of grace in our souls. If you think about it, that's just cooperation now further down the path. I'm cooperating under God's grace to increase my friendship with God. Think of it that way. And whether you are a cradle Catholic or someone who converted at some point, it's obvious in our experience that we can deepen our relationship with God, just as we can deepen our relationship with any human being we might know. It's a natural, normal thing in our experience. So think of merit as a way of deepening your friendship with Jesus Christ. I can merit a deeper, more intense relationship with God, otherwise known as an increase in sanctifying grace in my soul because God is the life of the soul in grace. So it's, it's a cell phone evening. <laughs> it always rings when I'm making a, a Catholic point, though. That's interesting. What's often passed over when people study the Council of Trent is, and this is kind of the operational side of me, which is they did two things that were most important. One was they mandated that bishops must reside in their dioceses. (laughs) And that you can only have one of them. Now that sounds like an administrative detail. It was huge for the reform of the church. And the second is the bishop is responsible for establishing seminaries to educate his priests. You might wonder how did a priest become educated prior to the Council of Trent, and it was rather informal, which is why when we were talking earlier about the priests uh, being lax, being illiterate in some cases, uh, apart from being immoral, uh, you can see why the people went for the Protestant uh, faiths in many cases. So the Council of Trent, of course, is known for its wonderful dogmatic statements on grace, on the sacraments, on the mass. But these administrative reforms were crucial to getting the church back on its feet in the day-to-day lives and geographies of where it was. Flowing ahead, I I wanted to spend some more time on merit because this is... This is nails on the chalkboard for Protestants, so let's soak on it some more. (laughs) You know, the, the typical statements are, how can a human person merit grace at all? So post justification, say you're in the state of grace, how can I merit an increase when grace is a gift of God? Or If I can merit an increase of grace in my soul, am I compromising it as a gift? Am I kind of tainting it? Does it reduce God to a grace dispenser on demand? A kind of bizarre rabbit's foot. You Catholics talk about merit. You reduce God to just some kind of superstition almost. Does God become our debtor? Is he in debt to me if I do something that the Catholic Church says, oh, that's an increase in grace if you do that? Like going to Mass, receiving communion. Does that 
mean God owes me something? Doesn't that compromise God's gift of grace? And actually, the Catholic view is a biblical view. This spasm of Protestantism is precisely that. It's a spasm, a psychological spasm. Let me explain what I mean. Our understanding of merit goes back to covenant theology of the Old Testament. And I hinted at it when I was talking about Noah and Abraham, where God made a covenant with the people of Israel. If you do X, if you abide by the terms of the covenant, if you keep the commandments, then you will inherit the land. Sounds like an agreement to me. Sound like an agreement to everyone who's studied the Old Testament with an objective view. Now, the fullness of this covenant is revealed in Jesus Christ. He is the new covenant, the new Adam, the new ark, etc. And as I put here, you remember the parable of the, of the day laborers in the vineyard? And Jesus compares the kingdom of God. This was not a side point he was making. He compares the kingdom of God to the landowner who contracts with the day laborers. And they each come at a different point of time of the day. One came at, let's say, 8 a.m., worked in the field all day long. They made an agreement on what the wage would be. Another one showed up at 10 a.m. Another one showed up at noon. Another one showed up at 3. They all got paid the same way. And the ones that arrived earlier grumbled a bit. And he said, the kingdom of God is like this landowner. Didn't I make an agreement with you? Didn't you agree to it? So when you think about it, Merit, under grace, isn't God being a debtor to us. He's being a debtor to himself, what he agreed to, the pact he made with us through Jesus Christ. He's being faithful to himself. Let's, Cardinal Cajetan, who actually debated Luther, uh, in the 16th century, and was also one of the few great Thomists of the 16th century, wrote this in 1532. Keep in mind, on merit, keep in mind, though, that to whatever extent there is a pact between God and man concerning a reward, still God never falls into our debt, but is only in debt to himself. For in view of the agreement made, there is due to our works the reward on which was agreed. God does not thereby become indebted to us regarding this reward, but rather indebted to his own prior determination by which he deigned to enter a pact with us. Consequently, we profess the full truth that God is indebted to no one but himself. Because as Catholics, we believe God makes real contact with us. There's a real handshake that God is faithful to himself in the pact with us so that we can earn, under God's grace, a reward. As a Protestant, we already have covered, God doesn't make real contact with us. He covers over our sinfulness externally. There is no real pact. There is no real covenant. There's no real agreement. There's no free will. You see the implications, how they go back and forth? Because we're realists as Catholics, we affirm the reality of free will. And we affirm the reality of God's gratuitous grace. Because we affirm both, we can merit an increase of God's grace. Because he makes real contact with us. He does change us. We can deepen our relationship with him. It's not some static accounting entry. We can really live a divine life, really, and we can increase it. The next one that is fingernails on the chalkboard, indulgences. We might as well get it all out, right? <laughs> indulgences are really based on two concepts, the community of saints and the church, as the body of Christ, is a treasury of graces of that community, starting with Jesus Christ. 
who is the head of the body, the church. So this mystical body of the church, which doesn't get enough play these days, spans all space and time, all human history. Those that have gone before us who are friends of God in heaven, those who have died who might be in purgatory, and those who are living, and those who will be born. This community of saints, we are in continuity with each other through our membership in Christ's body. That's point one. Point two is there is a, it's a poetic term, but a treasury of graces that the body of Christ contains through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in a special way through the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary, through the lives of holy men and women that are available to us under prescribed conditions that the church prescribes because the church is the trustee of this treasury of grace. Now, there are prescribed uh, conditions, and we just had a year of mercy, and some of you might have taken advantage of of the plenary indulgence that was associated with that. But one of the first conditions, and the most important one, is you make a good confession. Contrition, repentance, satisfaction, penance, and an amendment to avoid that (laughs) sin in the future. Then you are now available to continue in seeking the indulgence, either partial or full. Now, what's often mischaracterized is indulgence is this remission of the temporal punishment due to our sin. It is not a forgiveness of sin. This is often confused. Indulgences never have and never will forgive sin. They remove the temporal punishment due to our sins under the prescribed conditions I'm talking about. So they can be applied to us today, if we participated in the year of mercy, they can imply to those who have passed away that we're kind of nervous about. <laughs> and please, the second thing to remember, remember me, <laughs> because I'll need some help, uh, as you know, given my manner. So um, it can be applied to the souls in purgatory. And if you think about it, that's a much larger community than anyone who's even on earth right now. Possibly. So think of the tremendous graces that can be won for friends, loved ones of yours, that you worry about a little bit. You can help them shorten their time in purgatory by participating in indulgences. So they can be applied to the living and the dead in purgatory. Obviously, if you're in heaven, you have no need of this. And if you're in hell, you don't want the help. Okay. Yes. Now, the last slide is just implications, because I always want to touch ground with, as much as I can, with today, or at least trajectories that bring us to today. So what are the implications of Luther? And I'm not suggesting that he had these top of mind, but rather (laughs) implicit in Luther and the movements in history he spawned, because let's face it, he is a significant historical figure. Uh, But these are some of the trajectories that were generated in the early 16th and mid-16th century. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I mentioned the the theological refinements of of the Council of Trent as well as their administrative reforms, but it was too late. By 1545, it was simply too late. You had various diets. You had the Augsburg Confession of, I want to say, 1530. That, by the way, is a foundational document for many Lutheran churches today in the U.S. and throughout the world. If you go to the website, for example, of St. James Lutheran Church here in Lake Forest, right off of uh, Waukegan Road there, 
you will see a reference to the Augsburg Confession. I would argue that Luther was used largely by the political leaders in Germany and other countries would use their homegrown Luthers, as I put it, to advance their political and economic interests. I don't want to push that too far because obviously there were legitimate reformers in all those places who were attracted by Protestant theology. But it never would have got off the ground without the political and military support that it needed. Cuius regio, eius religio. That's a Latin expression meaning whoever's ruling, that's the religion. It's a famous Latin expression I thought I'd throw in there. Uh, this theme of the separation of morality from religion will gain steam here. Because if you think about it, if all our works are corrupt and do not contribute to our justification, you begin to see a divide occur between behavior, conduct, and religion and grace. And that will widen and widen and widen and widen. There is no such thing as nature. There is no such thing as natural law or natural law theory. That's just all a bunch of nonsense that the papists use. Probably most provocatively is this turn inward Luther initiated. And it, as I put it here, it prefigures Rene Descartes' move in the early mid 17th century of the cogito. You recall the famous slogan of Descartes, I think therefore I am. So Descartes' project, which started modern philosophy, was to reconstruct true knowledge apart from church authority by certain claims of reason left to itself. So that if you trace the history of Descartes all the way through to the British empiricists of John Locke, David Hume, all the way to the German system builders of Immanuel Kant and, and Hegel, they're looking for some evidential quality within reason itself that justifies thinking what we think on a purely natural basis, apart from any influence from religion. It's a turn inward that Luther started. Interestingly, Augustine, in his Confessions, mm -hmm. wrote a meditation that was inward, but he found God and order. Luther found human pus and corruption. Descartes is going to find the dualism of the spirit-body divide, among other things. He's not going to find order in nature. So what's interesting about this period of time in history, intellectually speaking, is the turn inward leads to fragmentation of the human person and society. The turn inward for Augustine led to God. The turn inward for Luther led to chaos. <clears throat> Kant, Immanuel Kant, is called the, ph the philosopher of the Reformation for this reason. He puts the dirt over the grave of metaphysics, as it was classically understood. I, I won't belabor this because this is inside baseball philosophy, but if you are ever interested in the, of how we got to where we got to, this trajectory from Luther all the way through up to existentialism, you can see it the steady march of the turn inward, life in isolation from God, leads to a kind of, almost like dropping a piece of glass on the ground. It breaks in all these different pieces and parts. So that's what I had for you tonight. Some of it was heavy sledding. Are there questions? Sure. Yes. So Luther actually was closer to the Catholic faith on this than the other Protestant faiths are going to be. Luther initially believed in something called consubstantiation, where Jesus is present along with the bread and wine. Uh, whereas as Catholics, we believe in transubstantiation, where the substance of the bread and wine are replaced by the substance of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, divinity. Luther will allow those two to coexist uh, initially. Uh, other Reformation faiths will say it's a symbolic presence or it's the community gathered only. Uh, and obviously that's not Catholic uh, teaching. 
Other comments or questions? I throw a lot at you tonight, but it's important that you know what was at stake. What is the substance of what was at stake? And what implications did it have for fragmenting Europe to the point where the United Nations now in its charter can't even acknowledge the role of Catholicism or Christianity in its formation of Europe? But continuing. So yes, the, the, the comment was the, the church tried to deal with Luther, but it, it took too long and it became too late. The, the popes tried to have the Council of Trent start earlier, but they could never arrange it. They could never organize it. Uh, and so you're right. Uh, the, theology does not happen in a vacuum. Sure. So the yes, question, question is, here. how would you uh, contrast the development of the Old Testament with, with the church's selection and development of the New Testament? Sure. What's interesting is... The early church fathers showed a preference for the Septuagint text of the Old Testament, which were the Old Testament written in Greek by diaspora Jews, who probably somewhere around in Egypt, who were away from Jerusalem and wanted to have Old Testament texts in their language, which was Greek. Those are the 45 books of the Old Testament that Catholics embrace. What Luther did was he went back to what are called the Masoretic texts or the Mazarines, which was a Jewish group that started around 70 AD and continued. There are Mazarine Jews to, to this day, but they began forming the Old Testament and excluded certain texts starting in the first century and going on. And some of the motivation for them excluding texts of the Old Testament was those crazy Christians were using them. <laughs> and, and the heavily Greek-influenced texts of the Old Testament, they jettisoned from their canon of the Old Testament. That's the canon that Luther selected. And it has seven fewer books in the Old Testament. All right. Well, maybe that's a good way to end. But thanks, everyone, for coming out.